Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 19th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Once again, it's brought to you by BarkingSquirrelCoffeeRoasters.com, BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. This week's favorite is Costa Rican. And of course, it's also brought to you by me. I guess uh, we're about halfway through the year, or getting close to halfway through the year. I might have to change my graphic, like I said last week, but... I still like this graphic because it, it pretty much represents this year. And I think that um, so far, this is what's happened this year. Obviously, it's been a little bumpy. But we've done okay in spite of that. So if you want to check it out, davelander.com slash trading service. And you can get started for a low introductory. And that, that is a teaser rate. It is not a cheap service. That's to, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't make any jokes about that. Um, but, yeah, I, I do want to keep them, keep it more of an exclusive club. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, Mark, I'm glad you can make it. We got a shout-out from the U.K. I was on Facebook the other day. And, uh, by the way, what happened with Facebook used to be uh, cute little kitty videos and Pictures of your ugly grandkids and and pictures of uh, your vacations, which we didn't want to see back when you were uh, back when you had slideshows <laughs> in somebody's home. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember that, but somehow uh, now it's uh, exciting to put them on Facebook, and I'm guilty as charged too. But uh, where did Facebook go from that, which was kind of fun, to like this big um, political thing, and everybody's got this world agenda and Good Lord, it's no longer fun anymore. But anyway, I obviously digress. I got this um, text from somebody in Brazil, and they wanted to know why is it difficult to be a successful and consistent trader. And this guy's interviewing a bunch of traders, and I was thinking that, oh, just, you know, I was going to give a quick little answer in this box, and I thought about it for a few seconds, and I started typing, and about a page or two later, I realize that this there isn't a quick answer, but if I had to give a quick answer, it would be the fact that we're just not made to trade. And that's because the real world and the trading world are two different worlds. Okay, they're worlds apart. Things that help you survive and prosper in life are often the same exact things that keep you from becoming successful and consistent as a trader and now of course for those of you who know me <laughs> we have the long answer so in the real world a high degree of logic is often required and in a trading world often there is none Now, let's take a step back for a second. There's only one reason that you should ever buy a stock. Does anyone know the answer to that? You better know the answer to that, or at least at the end of this presentation, you will. Anyone? Bueller? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's going up. Very good. It's going up. Yeah, but why would you buy it? Why would you buy it? Your answer, Donald and uh, Steve are answering questions that we're going to ask again later. The only reason to ever buy a stock, to make money. Thank you, Donald. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Rick says insider info. <laughs> it's in an uptrend. Ken, that's a good answer, too. Now, this brings us to our next question. Why do people sell stocks? Fear. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. Thank you, Steve. Good answer. Divorce. Very good answer. Ah, somebody read ahead. Yes. People sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Divorce. Yes. Death or estate settlement. Uh, kids' college. Maybe because they're buying a house. So 
Do you notice anything? None of the reasons had anything to do with the underlying company. Now, I know I've told this story quite a bit, but keep in mind we have new people coming along. And a lot of you people don't listen to me anyway, so I have to keep saying things. By the way, this whole presentation is kind of like a while back my wife read my column. And I was like, what do you think? She goes, well, you say a lot of the same stuff every day. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. Um, like the preacher that Anthony Robbins talked about. But this reasoning comes from Dick Fruth, from Fruth Capital Management over at Houston, Texas. And and Dick's a really nice guy. And again, I told this story a thousand times, so just bear with me for a second. But he started off as a broker. He's managing several hundred million dollars, which is pretty impressive because he has a very small office. So he's very efficient operation over there. He's a hardworking uh, guy running a uh, sizable amount of money. And he started as a broker, and back then the brokers would just uh, snatch the shares out of your hands. That's how long ago it was. People actually held their shares of a stock, and they kept them in their safe deposit box or wherever. And when it came time to sell, they would go to the brokers and hand, them the, bro hand the broker their shares of stock, and the broker would stamp them or punch a hole in them or whatever to say that they'd been sold, and then write them a check or however it worked. Well, Dick's a little bit different. He's, he would sit him down, get him a cup of coffee, chit-chat with him, and, and get to know the person. And this is where he learned very early on in his career that the, the, the earnings of the price earnings ratio of all you know, the GDP and, and the stochastic and Fibonacci and a lot of these things had nothing to do with why people were selling a stock. Now, again, we're going to – I'm going to beat the dead horse with another story that is just one of my favorite things that's happened. That's why I love going to these these American Association of Professional Technical Analyst meeting. It's not that I go to a meeting and I get some great trading system, go home and trade it. Because my wife was asking me, like, is it really worth your time to go to these meetings and effort and trouble and expense? And I'm like, yeah, it's not because I, I get some sort of great – trading system or learn something that I didn't already know about the markets, but just kind of a simplified way of thinking about things sometimes, not the more com. It's like I'm not getting more complex things out of it sometimes, but sometimes uh, just a more simplified way of, of thinking about things. Like Greg would always say, following is a key word of trade following. And sometimes you have to remind yourself of that. Well, one of the things that came up in one of the meetings is when you buy – a stock, you form a relationship between you and the company. And you expect the company to do great things and, and work hard to make lots of money so they could uh, enhance shareholder wealth. I think that's one of the catchphrases. But you're also forming a relationship with anyone else who has bought the stock prior to you. So it's not just you and the company expecting the company to do great things. And sometimes the company will disappoint you. Sometimes the CEO will say, hey, this uh, porn star I have working for me, uh, I want to see if she's, she's still got it, you know. And, and so uh, then the company loses billions of dollars overnight because they realize it's being ran by an idiot, okay. And there's some kind of lawsuit or whatever happening. So that happens. But for the most part – the company does have the interests of the shareholders and the interests of the company in, in mind, and they try to do the best they can. But the problem is anyone else who's bought the stock prior to you might get divorced, might have a margin call, might have a kid that needs to go to college, and a lot of these things could – or a can, I should say, exacerbate. It, it, you never know what the catalyst might be. And as Tom McClellan said, this is all stolen from Tom McClellan, and those people will screw you. So that really stuck with me, and that made a lot of sense. And I told Tom, again, to beat the dead horse with this story, for those of you who know it, but I told Tom, hey, Tom, I got to let you know, because um, – Kind of a long story, but I'm I'm in I'm in the forum, uh, Tom McClellan's forum, and used to be Bollinger's forum, and then Bollinger got sick of people fighting, and so Tom took it over or had his own forum, however it went. Anyway, 
So I, I, I'm in Tom's form now. And I said, Tom, I've got to tell you, I've, I've quoted you over and over again and, uh, to a point where it's it's almost ad nauseum because it was just such a wonderful thing that I got out of that, that meeting. He says, I'll do you one better. He goes, as far as quotes, here's one from my late mother, Mary McClellan, regarding market timing. Everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are far more sophisticated. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, Tom's got a pretty interesting story. His family was, uh, were farmers, and they were trying to figure out a way to get the best prices for their cri crops in the futures markets and or the markets and or hedge their bets. I forget exactly how, how it went, but they, they developed some indicators to do so. Uh, his father, Sherman, very smart man. I think uh, his mother might be a mathematician, too. I think they're a bunch of brainiacs. And uh, so they figured out there has to be a better way to get better prices. So people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, many of which have absolutely nothing to do with the underlying company. Now let's get back to our question, or the answer to our question, I should say. So getting back to the real world versus the trading world, in your own life, you really must control the situation. To the extent that is possible, okay? If you're going to be successful in any form of business, you really must control the situation. But unfortunately, in the trading world, you have no control over those aforementioned people. And the only control you have is yourself. And if you think about those aforementioned people, as the late Mark Douglas once said, and this is on a cassette tape I have here from a TAG conference, I think back in 1980-something or 1990-something. He said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. So maybe somebody fat figures something on a trading desk. Maybe uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a trader either. Maybe somebody from the Federal Reserve said something stupid. I know that's a redundant statement, but you get the idea. An off-the-cuff remark from a presidential, uh, someone uh, from the president or whoever, someone in his cabinet. I was once uh, put on a, a big, too big, really, but I was day trading, so I figured, what the hell. I put on a really big futures position, and I think that's back when the futures were a big contract. If memory serve, in the S&P futures, back when I was doing a lot of crazy stuff. And it was just day trade, so I put on a big position. I was making a bunch of money. I felt pretty good. So I decided to go take a shower. I did, uh, couldn't wait. You know, I'm singing in the shower. Oh, Dave, you're so smart. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you are the smartest of them all. You're a master trader. And so I get back to my desk after my shower and then everything is red and red in a big way. Well, come to find out some idiot decides to shoot, start shooting people in our nation's capital. So it happens and it doesn't necessarily have to be some guy at a trading desk hitting fat fingering something. It could be a much smaller catalyst, some selling that begets more selling for the aforementioned reasons, or somebody could do something stupid. You know, God forbid, maybe a terrorist attack or something. So, just keep in mind that a lot of illogical things can happen. Now, in the real world, if something doesn't work, you just keep searching and, and, and trying new things and trying new things, and eventually you'll get things to work. Unfortunately, the trading world, you must stick with one viable methodology Otherwise, you'll end up perpetually out of phase. As I often preach, with trend following, and this is something I see all the time. It's like the market does this. And they follow me, and I'm telling them, don't do anything, don't do anything, or we'll do a little bit here, do a little bit there. Sometimes we'll make a little, sometimes we'll lose a little. And people will quit. And then what happens? The market begins to trend, and we print money. 
So people give up usually right around here somewhere, right before the market takes off with the trend following methodology. So regardless of what you do, you have to stick with it long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, one thing that the other problem, too, is that let's say you do have a market that has a very nice oscillation to it like this. And a lot of people will start to think, well, wait a minute. If I sell options where the market's high and sell options when the market's low, obviously puts down here, calls up here, that I could do pretty good. And I'll get people email, hey, I'm just selling out of the money options, Dave. Forget this trend following. And I always say, well, that'll work until it don't. And if you're convinced that's the way to go, then do that for a couple years and get back to me. So far, nobody has gotten back to me. Now, maybe someday somebody will, but keep in mind that the black swan blow-up event and something leveraged like that is always possible. Yes, we have black swan. For those of you who don't know, that's Tlaib that he talked about. Just because you never see the black swan doesn't mean they, they, they don't exist. And just because long-term capital management never did see this huge adverse move, they thought they could just be brainiacs and, and Nobel Prize laureates or whatever they are and just trade this uh, spread system, and they thought they would just always print money, and then that'll work until it don't, as they painfully found out. It's okay that the government bailed them out. That's I, I think I. That always pisses me off when I think about that. The government never bails me out when I lose money. Uh, anyway, I digress. But just make sure you stick with a methodology long enough. It could be any methodology. I know I pick on the reversions to the mean people, but I think there's a problem with that. There's, it's it's uh, inherently flawed. Okay, But if you can make it work, knock yourself out. And also keep in mind, I've seen things work, and believe me, it's a, it's a two-drink minimum if you want me to tell you the stories. But I've seen things work for a long, long time, 20 years, believe it or not, and then blow up. So you got to be really careful, especially if you're getting into leverage, B reversion type of trading. But the point is that people usually give up at the worst times, and then they end up perpetually out of phase. Now, this isn't to say you, you're not going to have to try a few methodologies. The point is that once you find something you think is viable and you convince yourself it's viable and you do your homework, then you need to stick with it. And you will have to experience some good conditions, some bad conditions, and some inner, um, some in-between conditions, mediocre conditions, I guess the word, uh, what I'm looking for. Now, in the real world, you can't be wrong very much. But in the trading world, you're going to be wrong a lot, so you better get used to it. Now, I said I wouldn't pick on it. So it's, yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm kind of uh, on a soapbox today because um, I got a sort of a nasty gram from someone trying to explain to me that I, my way is not the only way to trade and blah, blah, blah. It, it, and it's not my way or highway, but do what you do and do it well, and then I'm going to do what I do and do it well, and I'm going to teach and preach about what I do because this is what I believe in. So it's not – I don't want to get in a fight with people. Just do what you want. But a lot of those so-called income-producing systems, they can be as much as 90% correct. So you're going to win darn out of 10 times. Well, that sounds pretty good, Dave. Yeah, but if you lose on that 10th time, if you make, let's say you make $1,000 a trade, and then on your 10th trade you lose 10000 now you're $1,000 in the hole. So it's going to take nine out of 10 trades to get back out of the hole, and if you get whacked again, provided you can survive that. So I can't live like that, and then you can't survive like that longer term. So if you don't know that if you don't know what your risks truly are, then you should not be trading such a system. I I, I think a so-called income 
producing system is is a complete fall fallacy. And somebody was telling me there's ways to make income from the market. There simply isn't. After years and years of searching and trying different things. Now, what I've learned is you could be a trend follower and you can grow your capital. And with that capital, you could that could be your income or that could be a way to, to, to invest in maybe something else. But as far as so-called income producing strategies, it doesn't work. You know, some people, oh, buy dividend stocks. That was a big buzz. Oh, geez, that's about 10 years ago. That was a big deal. Maybe 20 years ago. It's like dividends, dividends, dividends. Well, that's great as long as the stock doesn't go down because let's say you make a dollar in dividends and the stock goes down $5. Well, you're still down $4 net net. So with trend following, you're going to be wrong a lot. And as I often preach back when I did my mechanical testing, you're going to be wrong as much as 70% or more of the time, okay? But that 30% that you're right is going to make back all the difference in the world. So, Dave, you're wrong 70% of the time. Well, I think you could squeeze that trend following down to swing trading, and you can get those numbers a little bit better, okay? And hopefully be wrong a little – be wrong. Be right a little bit more than 50% of the time. But even if you're only right 50% of the time, as long as you're catching a few winners along the way, you could do really well longer term. So, again, there's a dichotomy between the real world – and the trading world, if you're a doctor and you lose half of your patients, you're not going to be a doctor very long. But you could be a trader and lose half, lose on half of your trades and sometimes even more and still do incredibly well. As I often say, the, part of the problem with, with people trading a methodology is they sharpshoot the signals and they end up losing money. So it's like we'll have a great run in a portfolio and we'll have – a few losses. It's like, um, hey, Dave, I'm going to quit. Why are you quit? I'm losing money. All right. Well, how could you lose money? It's We're kind of in a print money phase. Well, I'm losing money. All right. Well, did you get XYZ that took off? No, I, I didn't get that one. Well, did you get ABC that took off? No, I didn't, I didn't take that one. But you took the other three traders that were complete stinkers. So you got to wrap your head around the fact that you're going to be wrong a lot. And when you're wrong, it's not necessarily you, and it's not necessarily the methodology. Okay, sometimes stuff happens. Sometimes you hit a bad cycle. My favorite traders are those who come in when conditions are poor, when the market's choppy, and there's not a lot going on, and they survive a drawdown, and they say, Dave, I don't know about this. I'm like, just, just hang on, just hang on, just hang on. All of a sudden, bam, the market takes off. Well, when the market takes off, their expectations are tempered. They're like, okay, I know it's not always going to be this great. I know there's going to be some losses because I just had a bunch of them. Now I'm doing fantastic. It's not going to go to my head. The worst thing could happen is you hit my methodology or any methodology for that matter when things are going great, and then you hit that inevitable drawdown. That's when it gets really tough. All right, Donald says, sometimes trend following works best. Sometimes mean reversion works best. Why not do both? Well, Donald, guess what I do? I, I do both. I do both every day. So there's reversion to the mean trading. And then there's trend following. What I do as a reversion to the mean trader pointed out is, I do reversion to the mean trading within the trend. Ah, pretty smart, huh? We're looking to catch that short-term swing trade, and I'll show you a great example in just a few seconds, a few minutes, and take partial profits and hopefully get into that longer-term trend-following trade. Now, you're only going to be right about 30% out here, but if you play your cards right, you're real selective, you'll be right... 50% or so here. Now, as I often preach, your percent correct doesn't matter. It's how much money you make. Write that down. So, now Donald says, well, why not do both? 
if the market is doing this, why would I be a reverse to the B trader? And if the market is doing this, why would I be a trade trader? Here's the problem. Remember a few minutes ago I said you'll end up perpetually out of phase? I guarantee you will. About 20-something years ago, I met a trader who claimed if the market was, was breaking out, he was a breakout trader. If the market was trending, he was a trend trader. If the market was failing into breakouts and reversing, he was a reversal, tr reversal trader. I think this person, pardon my French, as my little French friend used to say, hey, that's English, was full of shit, okay? Maybe somebody can shift gears like that, but for the mortal man, you cannot. So you can't. Try to trade reversion to the mean trading when the market is reverting to the mean and switch over to trade trading when it's trading because what will happen is you identify this nice little reversion to the mean trading. As soon as you do, you get in like right here. You short the hell out of the market and what happens? Keeps on going. So on paper, I think it looks pretty good. It's a pretty good idea. But as – I didn't realize this, but I think Yogi Bear actually said this, but which was pretty smart. He said, in theory, reality – in theory are the same. I'm sorry. Reality and practice are the same, but in practice they are not. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But the problem is you'll end up in the church of what's happening now, and you'll end up chasing methodologies. I never know. When the next trend is going to come along, as I said last week or week before, I don't know. I beat the dead horse quite a bit, as you guys probably know. It drives my wife nuts. Short trip. But sometimes I feel kind of adamant about things and passionate about things. So you could end up in the church of what's happening now. It chasing methodologies. I forgot where I was going with that. I was trying to multi-process, which is a mistake. <laughs> It'll come to me. Sometimes you beat horses and bounce cats. Yeah, I do that. I'm guilty of that. Oh, uh, I think I, I know where I was going with that. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I, I, I kind of digress for a second. Imagine that. We had recently... As far as like the out of phase thing, okay. The market was kind of chopping around. It, was, it just didn't feel like it was seemed like it was going anywhere. There really weren't any sectors that were worth trading. So you would think, oh, this is a great mean reversion market. And somebody said sent me an email and said, Dave, I'm gonna back off the service for a while because I don't see any setups in any foreseeable in the foreseeable future. And we ended up with two trades the next day. I'm kind of like, this guy's right. I don't see any trades in the foreseeable future. But you have to keep chicken, chicken away, <laughs> chipping away at a methodology as long as it's a viable, viable methodology until things line up again and work for your methodology. Again, if you, if you change methodologies, you end up perpetually out of phase. So this gentleman was like, oh, I'm, I'm giving up on this. And then the next day later, we had two big trades, two big winners. I think one only turned out to be mediocre. We got another one still on. Eh, it's doing okay. We'll take a look at it one second. So, again, to, to beat the dead horse, to flatten the cat, to flatten the horse, to bounce the dead cat, um, as Phil says, you're going to have to find something and stick with it. Now, in the real world, you better take some action, okay? If you're a doctor, you better see some patients or you're not going to make any money. If you're an engineer and you build bridges, you better build some bridges or you're not going to make any money. If you're a lawyer, you better defend some, some bad guys <laughs> or good guys, whatever the case may be. But you're going to have to defend somebody or you're not going to get paid. In a trading world, sometimes the best action is no action. And as I often tell people, 
We're trying to get them to stop over trading. We're, we're trying to get them to stop day trading and reverse it to the B trading, even though now if you want to revert to the B trading, that's fine. But if you're doing that when you're trying to do what I'm doing and you're trying to do the, the sweet to intermediate term trend following and then you're firing off day trades on the side and firing off reversion to the B trades on the side, trying to catch tops, trying to catch bottoms, and you're doing all these things in addition to trying to do my stuff, then you might just be looking for action. So sometimes trading could be really boring, and you'll find that trading done properly is boring. It's it's a it's a horrible business to get into if you're looking for excitement. I got into it looking for excitement. Okay, I got into it because it looked easy, and I quickly found out that it was not. Had an uncle who sold a large stock position near prior lows. I asked him if he looked at the chart before selling, and his response was, I prefer to look at the check, not the chart. Ah, that's a good point. And, and eventually people do have an uncle point in the markets and throw in the towel. But it's a bad idea to try to catch those catch those lows and catch those bottoms. This leads us into our next point. In 2008, uh, or early 2009, I should say, the market had this just this this exhaustion type of sell off where everybody threw in a towel. But that doesn't mean that you should rush out and buy the market. I read somewhere that Warren Buffett sold a bunch of puts at the bottom. Now, why would a value player? I mean, I could see if he bought stocks at the bottom, but why would a value player who talks about, oh, you want to stay away from all these derivatives and stuff, sell a bunch of put options? So let's say that market continued to implode. He would have blown up. Well, value players aren't supposed to blow up. They, they're they supposed to just hold on forever and everything, and, and, and sit, eventually it comes back. Well, if you're selling puts, those puts might not come back. So I don't I don't get that, but that's another story. Well, that's a story for another day. Now, in the real world, you must control costs and seek bargains. So this is the next point. In the real world, you have to keep costs in line. Maybe the difference between your business being a success and not a success could be keeping your costs in line. We all love bargains. I I'm like Mr. Bargain Man. Whenever my wife wants something or the kids want something, I tell them, email me, and I'll I'll see what I can find. I'm in front of six screens all day. Take a break. Go to eBay. See who's selling it there. If it's brand, if something that they want that's that's brand new. Sometimes you can get a good seller there. Sometimes Amazon. Some you know, there's there's ways to find what you want. Online nowadays, Adam Smith Invisible Hand really works out pretty good. So I'm, I love bargains. Okay, there's certain things you need. You could, you could get on Craigslist, right? That pretty cheap. Because people looking to get rid. Of, I'm looking to get rid of some stuff now on Craigslist, cheap, you know. And somebody might need what I have and get it at a bargain. So in real life, in real life, to function, and it's also kind of fun. You want a bargain. But in a trading world, that's usually not a good idea. In 2001, the NASDAQ had lost over 50% of its value. It looked like that was a pretty good bargain at that time. Wow, 50% haircut. So if I buy it now, it goes back to the old highs. I made 100%. Unfortunately, in the trading world, it's off the darkest right before it gets more dark. So the rest of the story is, after being down 50%, the NASDAQ ended down 70% before eventually turning around. Well, why not buy at 70%? Well, it could drop another 50% from there. Okay. So, I mean, what's the math on that from from... 50% to minus 70%, how does that math work out? Let's say 2250 down to below 1500. That's that's another what, 750 points at least? 
So 750 divided by what, 2250 round numbers. So that's another 30, 40%, 30-something percent. So sometimes it's always darkest before it gets more dark. Dave, do you trade the entire portfolio with the methodology, swing trade, then position trade? Yes. We'll look at that in a second. Is what you're saying is that the trader must have back-tested the system with rules, with known results, and stick to the rules? To some extent, yes. It, it, it's I could kind of answer that question out of both sides of my mouth because I did do – Years and years and years and years of mechanical trading, which made me a discretionary trader. But you have to, and I think discretionary trading is the way to go because mechanical trading, you might, you get in if it's one penny above this. Well, that worked pretty good in 1999, but in more recent times, now you need to give it some wiggle room and apply a little discretion. And I can go on and on on that. I probably have. And, and, some of my 1500 or 1600 YouTubes, whatever it is now. But what you need to do is, is, is have some sort of methodology that you believe is viable. And ideally something that somebody else has spent a lot of time working on too, because that'll, that'll, that'll help your learning curve, obviously. And you want to go in and look at it in good conditions and bad conditions and things in between you, you you might not have enough time or money to survive several bull and bear cycles to get a feel for everything so you might actually have to go in and look at that on your own not only ask yourself how did it work and when did it work but ask yourself when it didn't work and it is a very complex world out there when it comes to trading one of the problems is that there's survival bias to certain things. So what you might not be seeing with your system is the fact that some of the stocks or markets that it got you into, uh, or specifically I should say stocks, are no longer in the database. If you had a, uh, some sort of system that was would buy stocks at low levels, then Enron would have obviously been a huge losing trade. And guess what? Enron's no longer in the database, so you might need a survival database if you're doing that. I don't want to digress too far into that. But it does kind of bring us to the next point. Experience is the best teacher, at least in life. <laughs> and I know, once again, here comes another another Dave antidote. When I was uh, was young, I might not have even, even been able to drive ahead on my grandfather had a boat passed on to my father, and he would let me use it on the weekends, and we'd go water skiing. And I might have been young to where I couldn't even drive or tow the boat or whatever. And so I had a neighbor who was a little bit older than me, a couple of years older, and he would he would come along. And uh, I was skiing, and I hopped in the boat, and I, I took the helm. And um, I started motoring over towards some kids that were playing on a big, huge block of styrofoam. This, I don't know if you guys can envision this or seen this before, but the pipe, when they put a pipeline out through the marsh or through bayous or whatever, they, they put huge blocks of styrofoam to float the pipes to get them in place before they sink them or whatever they do to them. And I guess one of them had broken free or whatever from a storm or something. And these kids were just climbing up on it and sliding off of it, and they were having fun jumping off of it. And and I started motoring over to them, and, and my buddy of mine's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, when I was younger, we used to buy these styrofoam surfboards at the beach, and we'd surf all day and have a blast. But that styrofoam, you don't you don't feel it at the time, but between the sun and the water and the salt or whatever, and that styrofoam rubbing on you, I said, man, you just get like your stomach gets all raw and, and and like the worst thing is your nipples get like nearly rubbed off and you can't sleep you can't even have a t-shirt touch your uh touch your chest and if you try to sleep without a shirt then the the, the 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 sheets just barely touch it and it's it's like a burn almost it's horrible and i said i gotta let those kids know 
that they need to, you know, put uh, even a t-shirt won't help you. It'll it'll somehow rub through a t-shirt. You know, I need to tell them that they need to be careful playing on that styrofoam. And a buddy of mine reaches over and he pulls the wheel and we were just kind of putting along. And he turns the the boat and he said very calmly, he goes, David, experience is the best teacher. So I was like, I never forgot that. So I learned at a very young age that experience is the best teacher. Now in the markets, it is good to experience a, a wide variety of conditions. I just said that. Unfortunately, as I often preach, the market could be a really bad teacher. Okay. Say you get stopped out 10 times in a row and the market turns around. Now, there could be some other issues that are happening there, too. But let's just, for argument's sake, let's say you, you're trading a viable methodology. You did your homework and you're setting your stops properly and the market stops you out and takes off. And this happens over and over and over and over and over again. So you know what? You're like, oh, forget these stops. You know, those system sellers that say don't use stops, they're right. So what I'm going to do is next time a market starts going against me, I'm just going to wait because it'll come back. And then what happens? It never comes back. Conversely, let's say a good problem to have. Let's say you get the little swing trade out of the trade, and then the trade comes back in, stops you out the rest. Okay. Let's say that happens again and again. So all you're getting is half off, okay? You're just getting half of the trade, and then you're stopping out on the rest. You're just making a small profit get stopped out. Well, so what you're going to do is you're going to say, and this happens all the time, whenever we're in the market where we just get swing trade, knocked out, swing trade, knocked out, swing trade, knocked out, which I don't complain about. It's better than poking the eyes, what I call it. But when this happens several times in a row, people say, Dave, why don't we take 100% of the profit here? Okay, well, if you knew that you had this permanent hypothesis that this would continue on, then, yeah, by all means. But as soon as you decide, okay, I'm going to start taking 100% of the profit, what happens? You that, that elusive big trade, big trend finally begins to develop. Okay, so and on a much more smaller scale – You'll have a lot of little tiny profits evaporate. Trust me, if you trade for a while, you'll get a little tiny profit evaporate, a little tiny profit, profit evaporate, and you'll think, you know what, I'm going to just start taking these little tiny profits. Well, as soon as you do, what happens? The market takes off without you. So the market can be a really bad teacher. You could get lucky quite a bit, and when you get lucky, you'll think, oh, that was great. And what did we talk about a few weeks ago? I forget who said it. It might have been Monnier. It might have been uh, Montier or, or one of these other guys. But as human beings, we tend to attribute luck to skill. And when we lose, we tend to attribute that to bad luck. And neither may be the case. Maybe the market just wasn't right. Maybe one of those aforementioned persons sold at the wrong time and screwed up your perfectly good position. So I can go on and on on this, but just keep in mind, I know too late, that the market could be a really bad teacher. So in a nutshell, quite simply, we're not made to trade, trying to apply logic, attempting to control the situation, and seeking constant action keeps many from becoming a consistent and successful trade. I, I bet this little guy in Brazil is sorry that I asked. <laughs> John says, oops, excuse me. John says, looks like the M&M strategy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. So, Michael, I don't know if I answered your question about the rules-based system, but you, you have to come up with some rules. They don't necessarily have to be mechanical, but you have to be careful when you are testing it, when you're testing something, okay? So find an edge and then figure out how you're going to make that edge work. Now, for me, it comes with discretion, and I, there was a guy that almost that I thought was pretty close to quantifying my stuff. It actually it made me a little nervous years ago, but I, th I think it's okay. That I, 
I wouldn't want to try to quantify everything I do because I think you have a brain in your head and you can use it and apply a little discretion and really make a lot more by using discretion as a try as opposed to writing something um, mechanical. Okay, so Michael got it. Yeah. All right, uh, we have a smoke them if you got an example this week. Smoke them if you got them is take partial profits on a trade because, like I showed you with the M&M strategy earlier, is you never know when the market will just give you that little swing trade profit and no more. So this was a recent setup. And the entry was 25. This is NTLA. The initial profit target was 28. I figured that based on this, this was an IPO. By the way, every time I think this IPO market's, bull market's going to end, it keeps going. And somebody asked me uh, talk, last week, I didn't want to talk about a position because it was an IPO and it was a, it was a pattern that I haven't um, said publicly. And they were wondering if I was holding out on them. And I was like, no, it's in the IPO course. Go back and rewatch it. So um, I think James was asking. James, if you're here, that answer your question. Anyway, this is the first pullback at an IPO, which is a pretty cool pattern to trade. So I figured 25, if it comes out of 22, I figured that was uh, the stock could be in trouble. And then, as you know, the initial profit target is simply the stop distance away, in this case, three points, plus the entry, in this case, 25, equals what? 28. So the initial profit target was right here. Now, second day, first day of the trade, depends on how you want to count. Day one, I guess this is day one. So let's just say day two into the trade, it began to move in our favor. So what we did was we ratcheted that stop up a little bit. And then on day three, intraday, it hit 28. So this is the tricky part that requires a little bit of work. It's not tricky. It, this is actually a rule, okay? This is a hard and fast rule. Once you hit the initial profit target, you take the stop and you bring it up to break even intraday. You don't wait till the end of the, end of the day. Because what if it hits the target and then it comes down and it finishes the day down here? It's not likely to happen, but it can happen, okay? Just because it doesn't happen often doesn't mean it can't happen. So you get that stop up to break even. Now, in this particular case, once you get the stop to break even, you're in a pretty good position. If the stock comes down and stops you out, then on a 100K portfolio risking 2% of the account, you make 1%. Now, those numbers don't work longer term, risking 2% to make 1%. But occasionally, we get the longer term home run, and that's what really makes it pay off. And I know some people just use me to pick their swing trades. That's fine. I don't care. You know, if, if I can help you do what you do and make what you do better, then that's fine if you're a pure swing trader. I just think that catching the occasional home run, and I know maybe it's psychological, a little bit psychological. People say, Dave, is your money management statistical, psychological? And my answer is yes. I want a short-term profit. I want to feel good right away. But I also want to... Uh, let my freshman psychology rear its ugly head with my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I want, want to get that self-fulfillment, actualization. And I also want to be right longer term. Well, also that right longer term makes a lot of money too. And that pays for a lot of losing trades. And that's the capital growth that you could take some of and consider that income as opposed to an income producing system like we talked about earlier. But by getting to break even, you're in a wonderful position. If you get stopped out, so what? Okay? At least you made some money. Whenever somebody gets mad about being stopped out at a scratch after making money or giving up some open profits, as I say each week, 
just send me the money and go center yourself. Just send me the money. Mail me a check. 20 years of doing this, I haven't gotten a check in the mail yet. Okay? Maybe somebody will send me a check. Just shut me up. That That's fine, too. I, 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 I'm okay with that. <laughs> then I can have a story to tell. I've only gotten one check in 20 years. So, as you can see, it's already come back in a little bit, but that's okay. You can stop that. You can stop that. So be it. Better to have loved and lost a little open profits than to never have loved at all. By the way, um, notice that it just barely got to 28, but it did get to 28. If you were in this trade and it got close to 28 and just starts meandering around intraday, because you're only a couple days into the trade, it depends on how late you get in the trade, how you want to measure it. Okay, you're only a couple days into the trade. When you get a move really fast and you're close to that initial profit target, it's okay to take profits a little early. This is not where the money is made. It's in the second loaf in the big trends where the money is made. So there's your money management example this week. Donald says, what are your thoughts on scaling out of the second half position as it goes, if it goes progressively higher as opposed to using a trailing stop? No, uh, I've tried. I've tried everything in the past. And what you want is, and this is the happy medium, you want you want enough on to where a swing trade is worthwhile, in this case 1%, if you hit the swing trade. And then you still want enough on to make that longer-term trend trade worthwhile. Now, in the end, you will give up some profits. Comes with the territory. I mean, I feel like this is a big beat the dead horse week, but like George Carlin said, when you buy a pet, it's going to hit badly, Okay. We got these chickens at our pets, okay? We love these chickens. We got a little rooster, and uh, yesterday a hawk came in and, and nailed the rooster. And, uh, eh, he might make it. I don't know. But it's kind of like, uh, you know, a little Tony. A little Tony's not going to make it. I don't know. A little Tony knows his name. It's like, well, you buy a pet, it's going to end badly, okay? But, you know, maybe in between you, you, you get some enjoyment out of it, okay? So in the end, the trade is going to end badly. No matter what the trade, no matter how great the trade is, you will have to give us some profits in the end. That comes with the territory. By the way, you can't be a perfectionist. I mean, that's another thing you want to put out. You probably want to be more of a perfectionist in life. As I often say, you can't have half your bridges fall down if you're an engineer. Well, I got to thinking about it. You can't have one bridge fall down if you're an engineer. You, you would no longer be an engineer. So at least in that particular profession, you better be very accurate. You better be a perfectionist. Well, in the market, you're not going to get it right. You just have to deal with the imperfect nature and give up some of the trade. So if you're scaling out along the way, then you're going to have a smaller and smaller position. And if that thing really does take off, if you finally do catch the mother of all positions, then your position is too small on your trend following loaf to make it worthwhile. So I've tried a little bit of everything. Okay. Maybe on the short side, if a stock gets halved overnight and you're short the stock, yeah, scale out of some of it. That's fine. Uh, maybe if something uh, is a rumored buyout or something, I don't know. Maybe you could edit stock doubles overnight. Maybe you could take partial profits off. I understand that. But for the most part, if you are switching hats to longer-term trend following, you want to keep that position on. And what happens is you make ground along the way. Yes, in the end, you're going to give up quite a bit of profits if you're switched hats. But you're, you're it's open profits, okay? And as um, Dennis, what's his name? Richard Dennis once said, he treated open profits differently than open loss. So let's say you are in longer-term trend-following mode. And let's say you're here and your stop is here. So you're thinking, well, I might scale out of some here and, and, and lighten up or whatever. But if that position continues higher and your stop trails higher, then you're gaining ground on the position because you were like here, but now you're here, okay? And yes, in the end, it's going to end badly. You're going to give up some of that open profits, but at least you're gaining ground on the position. Let's say that the stock goes up three points, okay, and you bring your stop up two points. So you go up two points and you stop. So you've gained some ground on the position. You're not gaining all three points. But you gain two points 
higher on the position. So you can't monetize the three points. You can't monetize the stock here and think shoulda, coulda, woulda, or what could I do with this money? Because you got to treat that trading account as money that you're going to trade and just grow and grow and grow. And then someday you'll, you might need it and do something with it. But you don't want to say, well, I need to or, or with that money in this trade, I could pay this off or I could do that or whatever. Because what will happen is you end up getting out way back here and you'll never hold on longer term. And then also... You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't look at it and say, oh, I should have sold while I was up there. You know what? You followed your system, pat yourself on the back. I'm getting emails from somebody recently. Oh, I almost bought that stock yesterday. Oh, I thought about buying it at its lows. It's like, well, if that's your system, then follow your system and do that. But don't do the shoulda, coulda, wouldas and make yourself nuts. So long-winded answer, no, this is the best that I found. This is what I think works and this is what I would stick to now on occasion it just opens up a can of worms and, and this is why I try not to point it out too much because then I end up answering emails all night but sometimes you could take those partial profits let's say you have on 200 shares make the math easy you take off 100 what's that leave you with so you have 100 shares left okay and let's say the stock pulls back makes a beautiful setup well you could put 100 shares back on and then flip out that swing trade once again, rinse and repeat, if you get pretty lucky, okay? That can happen. But this is not, this doesn't happen all the time. But let's say this stock doesn't stop us out, it goes on to make new highs, pulls back a little bit. Well, it's still a relatively new issue. Maybe it's worth still trading, okay? So, yeah, sorry, Chief Orman wound up today. All right, uh, any questions, anything so far? I'll start announcements, and then we'll hop into the markets. I'm still rolling out the website. Uh, each day I'm finding I found a lot of content that was buried um, from, like, years and years ago, some of, it, some of which I'm going to ditch for newer content. But uh, there's a lot of content out there that I'm able to – a lot of stuff that I am able to uh, unearth. And you'll notice – when you go to the um, – when you look at the posts, I have a, a button that says 500 more. So there's lots and lots of posts that are now con uh, easier to connect it, I should say. Uh, I'm still running the Fast Track special. Uh, there's only so much of, a, of my time available, obviously, so I can't um, offer to everyone. That's why I, I, I put an uh, expiration date of the 31st on that. So um, i got a few of those left. You guys are interested. Longer term, if you're serious about trading, it's a pretty good deal. It's an excellent deal, I should say. Okay, um, let's go ahead and hop into the charts. And let's see. <laughs> Thanks for a trip in your left ear and not the right ear. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why. That's kind of why I beat the dead horse so much. It's kind of like with... Uh, and kids will make you do that too. It's like, it's like, why are you beat the dead horse so much? Well, <laughs> stop messing up. <laughs> it's like, um, listen to me. Why do you complain about me not doing anything? Well, do something. Prove me wrong. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And I have problems with this market, okay? So funny, you, know, you tell people markets go up, markets go down. They look at you like you pooed your pants, or, or like you ordered a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Yeah, haven't said that before, have I? But you tell them that it might be going down, and they get all pissed off. Well, it might be going down. Right now, we're banging out new lows, as you can see in the S&P 500. So let's go back in time and figure out the last time the market was lower than it's lower than it is now, or about the same. And we can go all the way back to March 11th. So the middle of March. So now we're in the middle of May, almost towards the end of May, right? Getting there. So we've got over two months of sideways action here. Well, that's not the end of the world because the market has worked its way higher. Correct? Unfortunately, though, when you back the chart way, way out, 
you can go all the way back to 2014, well into 2014 in the S&P 500, and you can see we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. As I preach, today is preaching day, all right? And oh, by the way, I'm a holier than now. I meant to put a picture of me in my uh, preacher robes up here. No, I'm not holier than now. I still cuss and fuss and make mistakes and get aggravated <laughs> when it comes to trading. Trust me. But as I often preach, at least as far as technical analysis is concerned, never forget about net debt change. Where is the market? And look to the left side of your chart and say, where was the market? And if you find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. So you can see that we have, as the market drops, you'll end up with a lot of overhead supply to deal with. I use the term overhead supply, overhead resistance interchangeably. Overhead supply just simply means a place where people would look to get out at a market at break even. So this market has done the mother of all fake outs, I'm afraid, because it sold off hard. And everybody goes, oh, geez, and then it came right back. It actually sold off hard. If you go back to 2014, it came right back. And then it sold off even harder, and then it came right back. So since 2009, there's been a lot of smart people, and I'm doing air quotes, a lot of smart people who are buying, holding, and not selling at any cost. Unfortunately, like... Selling options and mean reversion, that'll work until it don't. So we zoom in a little bit. Again, we're at multi-month lows. Market's just kind of all over the place. You can't argue that it's all over the place. You can't argue with the fact that it's going mostly sideways. So since 2014, we just kind of wide and loosened sideways in the P. So that does not look good. As I said at nausea, I mean, somebody emailed me and suggested I should find another line of work. But this is my story. I'm sticking to it. We had a bow tie last summer, and that bow tie remains in effect until and unless the market goes out on to make new highs. A major signal comes off of all-time highs or multi-year highs, many, many year highs, let's say 10-year highs or multi-year lows, maybe 10, 15-year lows. And that signal stays in effect until those highs or lows are taken out. So until the S&P 500 takes out the old highs decisively, that sell signal remains in effect. Doesn't mean that I didn't get stopped out of short positions. It just means that a long position has to be a pretty good looking stock. Either it has to be a commodity that's trending because they could trade contra the overall market or some kind of speculative issue like that aforementioned IPO that could care less about the GDP or retail as a as a massive sector or whatever's going on in the overall market that might have some fundamental i know i just said the f word fundamental influence on it something super speculative with no fundamentals and could care less about economics that can trade contra to the overall market too all right that's the s p 500 nasdaq nasdaq looks a little worse than the peas okay the lows are a little bit further back here. So you can go all the way back to what? Uh, beginning of March. So now we've got two and a half months of sideways trading. And one thing to kind of think about is I, I saw some post about somebody was, um, it was in McClellan's group. They were talking about uh, somebody's working on an indicator. Or it's like I skim these things. I don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing them. But I kind of got the gist of it, saying that if you look at the number of unchanged issues, then that means the market could be losing momentum, whatever. And that makes sense. So as long as the market's not making progress, then it could be losing steam. And I like the way one of the guys explained it. He said it's like throwing throw a bunch of tennis balls up in the air. When they hit their apex, when they get to the top, they're going to stop for a little while, okay? So kind of think about markets like that. Either they're going up, they're going down, or they might be stopping somewhere in between in that transition. So NASDAQ also major weekly sell signals there too. Uh, Multi-month lows, again, back to chart way out. And draw a line going all the way back to win, 2014, like the piece. Lots and lots of supply to deal with there. 
Nothing magical about that. Just a spot where people might be looking to get out at break even. The Rusty looks the worst. The Rusty has been kind of textbook, um, especially with the bow tie sell signal, so far at least. Now, yes, it's had a big retrace, but you can see that it had a massive or major sell signal back here. It did take, it did come back a little bit, but then it imploded, and then now you got a big picture retrace. I'm not a wave counter, but it does look like kind of like a, a little ABC down or whatever they would call it. But it's a it's a one retrace, I should say thrust, retrace, thrust, big retrace, rinse and repeat. And I'm I'm kind of anti, you know, it's not my way or highway. I think you can get into a lot of trouble trying to count waves. But so far, just with basic technical analysis, it looks like a big it depends on how you want to count it, but a big thrust down, pull back, thrust down, pull back, rinse and repeat. And on top of that, you've got a mountain of overhead supply. And now, where are we now in the Rust D? We're right here. And you can go all the way back to 2013 in the Russell 2000. And you can see, depending on what date you pick, but let's go back to the summer of 2013. Last July, I'm sorry, July of 2013. The market hasn't made any forward progress since then, or very little. Okay, look at the close. Look at the close way back here in July, August 2013. And again, a mountain of overhead supply to overcome. Now, let's take a look at the – if you guys want to ask about individual uh, stocks, you can start asking now. We'll, we'll get to those in just a few minutes. Now, if you take a look at some of the sectors in here – there are quite a few areas that did rally up a little bit, but then have turned back down. So they're not the most cleanest setups in the world or however you want to look at it, patterns in the world. But you can see transports, bigger picture, have had a pretty serious slide, a retrace. Maybe a weekly will give you a prettier picture of that. So transports still look like they're in trouble here. Major, again, major bow tie here, transports, okay, all-time highs. That looks pretty ugly. And you can go through sector after sector and see this reoccurring pattern. One thing that concerns me is, and this is why you don't play the only game in town, okay? Let's say uh, pure relative strength trading. Now, I'm a big fan of relative strength. I'm a big fan of momentum. But you got to be careful with pure relative strength, especially if the overall market's in trouble. So you're thinking, okay, well, let me go to this. Let me run to the foods because it's a so-called defensive area. And they did break out a little bit, but then they've already come right back in. Utilities, great example of that also. Okay, it's like they started making brand new highs, and it's like, well, Dave, aren't you a momentum trader? Yeah, I am, but I'm a little skeptical when the overall market appears to be in trouble. And then look what utilities have done so far. Retail, another example, another great example of trying to play the only game in town, especially when the underlying pattern – within the sector is somewhat concerning, okay? So, yeah, it's at new highs, but it was right at the level it was way back in 2015. It also had this V-shaped recovery at high level, okay? And then tried to break out recently, and now it's coming right back in. So I think we could see a plethora of shorting opportunities in the retail stocks. Now, we did buy the energies recently, and we did buy the metals and mining because they were coming off of major, major lows, and we had bow ties and first thrusts and all types of beautiful setups coming off those lows. Do we have weekly yet? Yeah, we almost have a weekly uh, buy in those areas. But now they're beginning to look slightly questionable. And a few days ago, we'll get to metals and mining in a second, but a few days ago I was telling my peeps that I was concerned about the X and me. But you can see energies have pulled back, and they were kind of anemic in their rally out of their pullback. And that always concerns me when you have a pullback. You want to see thrust, pullback, and then thrust again. You don't want to see thrust, pullback, and then drift. Okay, this is not a good pattern. I don't like this pattern at all. And so the energies could be in a little bit of trouble, but so far the uptrend remains intact. I would just honor my stops. Metals and mining looks a little worse, at least at this juncture. And a few days ago, I was telling my peeps in the service, and again, notice that you have the thrust, and then you had the pullback, and then you had like the drift action instead of like taking off again. And my concern was if we took out the recent lows in the XME, 
then we would be where? We'd be right here towards this prior little base. It doesn't mean it's not the end of the world just yet. It's still in a, in a intermediate term uptrend, but I definitely would honor my stops just in case, okay? A market's job is to try to shake out as many people as possible. And again, that's the bad teacher thing. So you're like, oh, it's just trying to shake me out. I'm going to hold off and then hold on. And then what happens? Then you really do have the mother of all reverses. So you have to have a stop in place just in case. Hey, I like that. Have a stop in place just in case. Real estate, another one of those areas that tried to take off, came right back in. Now, some of the pressure in the utilities and real estate might be because bonds had a little spill yesterday. Uh, they're recovering a little bit today, but bonds kind of sideways at best. But shorter term, you can see the bonds have kind of sold off a little bit. Maybe that's part of the problem there. And gold, gold sold off a little bit. Gold's been real tricky because gold was off to the races, and then it kind of stalled out, and it tried to take off again. And then it kind of stalled out and then try to take off again. Now it's kind of stalling out a little bit. So it's been really hard to hop on board gold stocks because they kind of did, they did the pattern I don't like. They kind of came out of their pullbacks like this and then they, and, or they, then they took off like that. So it's been kind of a, a, a quirky pattern. And the pullback here wasn't uh, like an individual gold stocks. A lot of them just had like a little shallow pullback and then they kind of went like that. So, Again, it's not my way or highway, but the, the point I want to make is my methodology. Let me rewind that. The point I want to make is my methodology is not the be-all, end-all, because sometimes it just doesn't fit It doesn't fit every pattern. You're not going to catch every single pattern. You will catch a lot of them, and I think you'll catch enough of them, and especially if you're paying attention to these emerging trend patterns, such as bow ties and first thrusts, you will have some sort of emerging trend pattern in the markets at all tops and at all bottoms. So as far as that pattern is concerned, yes. But sometimes once something is in an established trend, you won't always get the perfect time to get on board. And I'm working on that. Okay. Let's take a look at um, – Otis wants to know about MZOR. Okay. Well, this one's kind of an electrocardiogram. I mean, it did okay. It looks like it was taken off, but then it had a sharp retrace, and then it took off again. So that's a good example of it's not always going to catch everything. Uh, it's also super thin. It's too thin. As a private trader, yes, you could you could trade it. But it's very dangerous, and on top of that, it's it looks like electrocardiogram. So I would leave that one alone unless it could make some multi-month highs and it maybe look to play the pullbacks along the way. Now that you mentioned relative strength, Don Warden solved problems years ago using V7 that you are using. There are consistent uptrend data sets, FX5, 5% upslope, FX20, 20% constant upslope. They are in your V7 Tello chart. They solve the replace relative strain problems with SP as a reference. FX5? I'm not sure what that is. Fixed rate of return? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is, um, Michael. I'm not sure what the. the My relative strain problem is that relative strength adds badly. And. Sometimes I use the words relative strength and, and, and uh, momentum interchangeably, but but a pure pure relative strength model, you would be buying things like utilities a couple of weeks ago because it's the highest relative strength type of area. You, you, area. You're better off if you were going to do relative strength. You're better off with a, with a delta relative strength, meaning a change in relative strength, and that's why. I was excited about these energies and metals and mining because the, the delta, the change in the relative strength was so great, and that's what made them worthwhile. Andre wants to know about IAG. This was a stock mentioned recently. I think IAG is looking okay. Um, it's had a pretty tremendous run to it. 
because it went from like 175 to four. So, but it's okay. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. The sharper the uptrend, the sharper the knockout move that I'd like to see uh, within a stock. But it, it's looking okay. CDE, that's going to be uh, a silver stock. Uh, again, you know, nicely trending stock could use a little bit more pullback. So, yeah, these metals of mining, this correction is either just that, a correction, or it could be a reversal. Right now, so far, it looks like a correction. Overall, it's looking a little scary. But on an individual issue basis, especially in some of these stocks like CDE, where you have a nice persistent uptrend, it looks so far just like a correction. Now, keep in mind that because it's ran up about 400% or whatever that is, you're going to want a serious, serious correction. It looks like I drew one in from last week before we look at it get on. AUI. Uh, you know, here's one of those tricky things with the gold stocks, okay? So it kind of was off to the races, and now it's just kind of chopping around. So for me to get excited... It would probably have to make new highs. It does have a bit of that double top knockout look to it. What was the stock? Well, I can't show it, but there was a stock recently that had a double top knock, uh, knockout look to it. Uh, I would hold it off on this one for a while, and then let's just see what happens. Um, I'd have to see what it looks like on a knockout move. And it's weird. I used to Years ago, I used to put in prices into my charts to see what would happen and how they would look, but now I just let them unfold and look at a lot more charts. How do you market, how do markets perform during an election year? Oh, you know, that's a seasonal pattern. And as a general statement, markets go up during an election year because they tend to be manipulated. Did I say it? Yes, I did. I could say that. But it's not... It's it's not actually a something you could trade off of, okay? And also, I've seen some people do some research, and they actually show that it's, it's more like a five-year cycle than a four-year cycle. Every fifth year is a good year as a general state, okay? The problem with seasonality trading or a longer-term cycle is you might be on to something, but you can't trade off of it. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to buy every election year. That's going to be my trading system because – Again, that'll work until it don't. Maybe there is a slight edge, but if you if you have a very small representative sample, let's say 100 years, then some sort of seasonal pattern like that could not work for several years but still be statistically valid, okay? So I wouldn't get too excited about an election year or not. Okay, IAG, we just did that one. Yeah, everybody keeps uh, – yeah, it needs more pullback. EXK, it's going to be a, a silver stock. Yeah, this one looks okay. Um, it, and again, you've got that pattern where it kind of chopped around a little bit in here. But with these silver stocks and gold stocks, two things. One, you tend, I tend to be a little bit more lenient because they can chop around quite a bit. But it has lost some steam. I think I might pass on this one. If you back the chart out a little bit, it looks okay. It looks maybe like a two-day chart. Yeah, see, a two-day chart looks pretty good. Two-day chart kind of just looks like a like kind of a trend knockout type of thing. But I think I'm going to pass because it's going sideways and chopped around too much. In VTR for Mr. Phil. I better plot a 50-day moving average. Yeah, this was one on the radar a while back. Um, it's pulled back too many days in here. But I hear you. Um, it's improving as an IPO. And then um, you could possibly, I'm not a big breakout fan, but as you know, in IPOs, occasionally there's a breakout. Rick wants to know about Target. Just don't go to the bathroom. Yeah, Target topped out it here obviously but now it's too late okay looks like they missed 
But you can see that so far, a pretty serious downturn. You know, maybe on pullbacks along the way, but I think that there's other retail. I think this might be like the first shoe to drop in retail or one of the first shoes. I think there could be some other ones possibly soon. FCX, that could be a Freeport back moron. And the problem with Freeport McMoron is it, it's it's been really choppy as of late. And let's just draw a horizontal line. And you can go all the way back to March without much forward progress. So that would have me concerned. So I would dig a little deeper within the um, in the metals. VGZ, GSV, AXU have more than 40% on high volume, although they report 50 to 20 employees on staff. Thoughts? Uh, Andre, you know me. I don't, I don't confuse the issue with facts. Um, you know, those gold companies, if they start, they're, they're super leveraged in that if, uh, it provided they're not hedged, if they're hedged, that, that it kind of screws up everything. But as the price of gold rises, they could, they, their percent of profit grows geometrically. So they're sort of they're leveraged to begin with. The gold companies are, that is. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. Steve says, nice webinar. CM. CM. Uh again, you know, not much forward progress in quite a while. Banks banks aren't looking so great longer term. So it would be hard for me to get excited about a bank. Now, this is a Canadian bank. Maybe they have something to do with gold, okay? Maybe that's why they've been in such a good trend. But if you take a look at banks overall, it has been a pretty trip down. But I think I have an arrow drawn in already. You can see it's been, it's been a trip down nonetheless, okay? So we got to shake it out of one a while back. I know some of you guys held on with a little discretion. You know, kudos for you to you but you can see banks still in a pretty serious downtrend maybe on a weekly basis a little bit clearer but you know wide and loose but for the most part in a downtrend sorry see i uh, you know what that might be my eyes i wish there's a way to to put a bigger font on this thing see i am all right see i am i was wondering why steve was asking about that one yeah this one looks much better uh unfortunately it's it's real estate okay and then longer term, you know, people always say, well, Dave, how far back does this overhead supply matter? And it's like, well, it depends. OK, it's like powder stew. I'll know when I see it. But when I see this much overhead supply, keep in mind that markets have very, very long memories. So even if you do get long this stock, it's going to run into a mountain of overhead supply. Also, look at your HV. It's 17. That's pretty low HV, especially when you're considering some of the stocks we traded in more recent times have had. Um, serious uh, HV, like in the um, triple digit range, at least 89. What's CNX? 77, okay, on the HV. That's one that we're long. Um, also, it, it kind of broke out. I mean, it's only like a one point breakout, came back in. I would leave it alone. It's got a plethora of problems, Steve. Number of employees in the company is something to consider? No. No, the, what you consider is, is let me show you what you need to consider. If I could find it. Here we go. This is what you consider. You flip over my business card. I know you have one. We had dinner together not long ago. Um, and look at the back. This is all you have to consider. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? That's all you have to worry about. Life gets a lot easier. Because here's the deal. What if what if that is a problem? You know, there's, a few, there's only a few employees. So now you have to pass on a stock. It goes straight up without you. So what do you do? It's like, so, or you like the only few employees that go straight down. Aha, I knew I should have taken that stock because it has few employees. See, now I'm, I'm, I'm smart. I missed that losing trade because I, I figured a correlation. Well, Mark could be a bad teacher. Um, as I often preach, this, the best stocks to trade are those with the worst, absolute worst fundamentals. And I often say, one day, you're welcome, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, I often say that someday I'm going to invent a system, design a system that is a combination of momentum with bad fundamentals. And that would you would have to have bad fundamentals. 
And then it kind of dawned on me, uh, idiot, you already have eBay L. That's going to be an IPO. Um, it looks pretty good. But the problem is when you first look at it, it looks fantastic. In fact, I wasn't going to bring it up because I knew it was an IPO and I knew it might be something that, that could find its way to the service initially. But anyway, the reason I did decide to bring it up is because after thinking about it, the it's, it looks like a fantastic trend, but you have to look at where it was and where it is. It went from 25 to 26 in about six weeks. So if I was just initially seeing this chart, I remember seeing it yesterday. It's like, wow, that looks great. Can't wait for a trend knockout. Can't wait for a pullback. Well, that's one point. One point, okay? So, yeah, it looks good. But if you were to put like a, let's see, this is even three points, okay? If you if there were a way, I don't know how to do it. If there was a way to get like a 10-point chart in here, I don't. I remember. I don't remember how to do it. Um, it wouldn't look so impressive. See, it looks a little flatter now when you when you widen out the chart a little bit. So, I would pass on that because it, it was a very small run. Okay. W Y N N is a short. A couple of people asking about that one. Um, well, the problem is, I kind of sound like the, the squirrels are back. I guess the squirrels are back, Barking Squirrel Coffee. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll keep that added one more time so I can make a joke about that. Um, it is kind of rolling over, but it's rolling over at fairly low levels. So, yeah, it's probably in trouble, but I'd much prefer to find a stock like that up here, okay, than to wait for it to be all the way down here before looking at the short. Now, if we get into a rip roaring longer term bear market, and by the way, it looks like you do have a setup here, or you had a setup, uh, in perfect hindsight, of course, but I'm sure if you put a bow tie in or something, it's, it's there. Um, if we get into a rip roaring bear market where everything's in a downtrend, then yes, by all means, we'll be trading stocks that are in downtrends, established downtrends, okay? But as far as shorts are concerned now, and I was, I was having a conversation with somebody last week or week before, uh, before yeah look you got a first thrust down so you want to find something like in the early phases of rolling over that look like that as opposed to something that's already a longer term downtrend let's see what they're doing overall it, it the conversation I was having with someone earlier this week is you want to match the pattern to the market so take a look at like the S&P SP 500 It's still at relatively high levels. It's not that far from all-time highs. It's just beginning to crack, okay? So in your gaming stocks, what you probably want to do is you want to find those that are at higher levels. Let's see if we could find something at a higher level. And you want to focus on those as opposed to ones that are already down here at low levels. Here's a great example. We shorted Carnival earlier this year. I know it's a little wide and loose. But we caught a nice little ride out of it, okay? But it was coming off of like all-time highs. Now, unfortunately, it didn't continue to implode. But it was coming off of major, major highs. So you want to try to find something at higher levels at this juncture. And if it's not in the casinos, maybe look somewhere else. Like Boyd, for instance, would have been a better place to look because, see, you got a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever coming off of all-time highs. That would be a better opportunity than something that's already way down here, okay? MTN, that's kind of thin, but kind of rolling over from high levels. See, that that would be a better opportunity, again, than something at low levels. TXN rolling over too early. TXN. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, HV is kind of low, which is okay sometimes in a short situation. Yeah, it looks like it's kind of in trouble. It's just not quite enough break for me to get excited about. And that's kind of the tricky part on the short side. Is sometimes they don't break enough to set up. Uh, but yeah, it certainly keep that on your eye. Before I forget, let's take a look at Apple real quick. 
Um, Apple still looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Now, I'm not going to rush out and short Apple, but obviously Apple, let's just draw lines here. It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see. It was way up here, and now it's way down here. So you draw your little arrow. So Apple's headed lower. Apple is a main component or a big component of indices. So it could take down the market with it, okay? And not enough time to get into that. We talked about it recently in the column. Do you look at Bowtie and XAU for overall take action on precious metals? Um, yeah, I look at the, the sector itself, okay? Look at this beautiful bow tie back here. So, yeah, you can look at the sector itself. And you had a bow tie back there, so that would look pretty good. And then now you have, so far, it just kind of looks like a double top knockout look to it. Because if you look at the run from here to here, that's a pretty impressive run. Then you just have a small consolidation, a little bit of a pullback. So XAU still looks okay. But, yeah, when you look at that sectors, we, I was looking at the, the, the bow tie and the metals and mining and the, and the bow tie and the energies when we're going up to some of those uh, bow tie and energy stocks. Okay. GSAT. We only have like a minute left. Uh, no, this 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 move here, this wide wide range bar is too extreme. I hear you though. Uh, MVTR. Yeah, we talked about that one. Sorry. Um, AXTI. That'll be the last one. No, Andre. Uh, kind of thin, and, and then look at this wide range bar. That's too extreme, and then it kind of drifted up from there. Uh, you want to see a breakout and then like a pullback. You don't want to see a breakout and then like a drift up, strange looking pattern like that. Um, no, I would pass on that. Uh, and then super thin, especially when you factor in the dollar value. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, as usual, I appreciate everybody uh, coming. Uh, another lightning show. Thank you, John. You're welcome, James. You're welcome, Rick. Uh, I appreciate you guys showing up and girls. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and flattered and humbled that uh, you guys are here. So uh, any un unanswered questions, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk again, uh, I guess I'll see everybody again uh, next Monday. Thank you so much. Next Thursday. <laughs> Thank you.